And so on the Passover night in Luke 22, you will also find the exact same account in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. You will discover as they took the Passover meal that they were celebrating what God had done in the past and what God is doing now. I don't believe the disciples were very aware as to what Christ was doing at this point. I, I believe they were clueless in, in, the, in this meal. They took it, they were having the last meal with God, it was the Passover meal, but they had no idea that that meal represented the coming hours in the life of Christ. And so we come upon this meal and we realize that there are a couple of elements that we really need to pay quick attention to. And let's look at those, starting in verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until what is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood and it is shed for you. I want you to notice that first of all, the Lord's Supper means a future promise. Notice in verse 14 through 16, he gives the, Luke gives the historical account <clears throat> that the hour had come and that the, the, the apostles had, had reclined at the table. They were relaxed. They were all going to share in this meal together. But quickly, Christ was going to change. Christ was going to change the attitude of the meal. So we come up to verse 15. Then he said to them, I have fervently, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It was the desire of Christ to share in this magnificent fellowship with his people. And then here's the promise. He makes this statement twice in this text. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until what is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now I don't know about you, but I've studied this text a hundred times in my life, and I often wonder what in the world does that mean? And briefly, when I studied this text, I just kind of passed over it. <laughs> Sorry for the pun, okay? But I, I kind of passed over it. Well, I, I had to come to the point this week when I looked at that text, I couldn't pass over it any longer. And so I, I took the text and I, and I looked at, real quickly, the Scripture references that is referred to it. And the Scripture references that is referred to verse 16 is Revelation chapter 19, starting, I believe, in verse 9. And when you look at that verse, what you come to it's the sweet marriage fellowship that Christ has with his people after the rapture. You come to that sweet marriage feast. Just take, put your thumb right here in chapter, tw in chapter 22. Turn over to Revelation chapter 19. Nineteen verse nine. Then he said to me, "Right, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb." He also said to me, "These words of God are true." Then I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, "Don't do that. I am a fellow slave with you and your brothers. We have the testimony about Jesus. Worship God, because the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy." Do you notice verse nine? Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. When we come to that verse there in verse 16, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What Christ is referencing at 33 AD, at his age, 33 years old, is he is referencing what Luke will see in the vision come right around 91 AD. Long before Revelation was ever documented or written, Christ was quoting it. Now go ahead and explain that, you skeptics. Anybody skeptics? Go ahead and explain that. I, I can't explain that. 
just further evidence that he has to be God. But what Christ is referencing in the text is he's referencing the future resurrection that you and I will have with him. The future fellowship that you and I will have with him for eternity. Or at least for those that are saved. Folks, isn't it amazing that this meal doesn't start with the cup and the bread. It starts with the resurrection. It starts with the resurrection in us. It starts with our eternal fellowship that we'll have with Him. I want you to understand that when you take this meal, before you grab the cup out of the tray, before you take your little bitty piece of bread, that this meal represents our eternal fellowship that we're going to have with Christ when we die. For those that are saved. It means a future promise. But then as we come to it, we realize we get to, first of all, the bread. I mean, the cup. He takes the cup at the very beginning and he just introduces it for us. We find out that the Lord's Supper means we have a shared Savior. That we have a shared Savior. Look with me, starting in verse 17. Notice he takes the cup first. He takes it twice in this text. The first time he takes it, it says that he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, folks, again, he mentions, his, he mentions the resurrection. But what he does is something that he's done over and over and over and over again in his life. You can look back when he fed 5,000 and when he fed 4,000, he gave thanks. He first took this cup and he held it high and he blessed it. He thanked God for it and then he shared it with all of them. Now this is very unique because history tells us that when you take the Passover, that you use your own cup. That you go forth and you have your own cup for Passover and everybody drinks out of their own cup. But here we notice that Christ pushes away their cups, and they use his cup. All of them are sharing in his cup. That's exactly what he says. Look back in the text. Take this and share it among yourselves. Pass it around. Everybody drink from this cup. Everybody take their sip from this cup. Pass it around. Everybody is allowed to take this cup. Almost. Notice what he says in the text. Share it among yourselves. He is referring it to people that already believe, that already trust, that already know Christ. He keeps it within that group as we're going to see in a minute because the meaning behind the bread and the cup is reference to those who are already saved. As I will say again in a minute, that only those that are saved that have had the power of Christ's salvation are allowed to take this cup. It is shared. And it gives us a, an incredible implication of evangelism here that we are to share the suffering of Christ, we are to share the brutality of Christ, the pain of Christ, for the freedom of our sins with the entire world, so that the entire world can enjoy that marriage feast that's promised to us in Revelation 19. This bread and this cup means we have a shared Savior. And then now we come to the elements of it. We come to the bread. Now, the bread represents for us a broken Savior. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now folks, I want you to notice first and foremost that the same way that he took the cup at the beginning, he takes the bread. He gave thanks for it and then he broke it. The reason that he broke the bread is that the bread symbolizes the broken body of Christ. At every Passover meal, when they took bread, this loaf of bread represents the body of Christ. And he broke it. 
He broke it. Not just so that each person can receive a piece of it to eat. But He broke the bread to show them that the body of Christ will be broken for them. See that clearly in the text. This is my body, which is given for you.